that well. Uh, in a second you'll be able to uh, not only see it more but understand the importance of the book. I'm going to try to show you a photograph. Uh, it's actually a uh, an artist rendition. It's sort of hard to tell with the uh, with the camera lens here. I'll adjust it a little bit here. That's much better. It's upside down, but I can at least see what I'm doing here now. Uh, at this position, you see the fiery crash, and you can see off to the uh, lower right-hand corner uh, by my arm, uh, you can see hangar number one. You may even see some of the buildings in the background. If you look, you'll see three uh, uh, air handler type stacks uh, directly on top of those buildings that are off to the right hand, uh, I'm sorry, to the left hand side of hangar number one, as we can see from here. Now, this book was sent to me from Jeff, who is in Australia, and it includes many fine photographs that explain exactly how the Hindenburg was built, how it was taken from one part of the world to the other, and here's just a, a beautiful photograph, I think, a, a beautiful uh, illustration uh, right here. Uh, I'll get a better shot of this later for you, but it shows the Hindenburg and it shows the hangers, uh, or I'm sorry, the hangar, hangar number one. Again, let me move this book and what I'll do is I'll go ahead and zoom in on that hangar number one some and let you see that and compare that book and that picture of the hangar. Now it's a very gloomy day and I came out here on a gloomy day on purpose to try to capture the uh, the mood of the uh, the image in the book and in, in the uh, in the sky. Now again, here is it's very hard for me to do this upside down, but here is the image of the book, and again, there's the hangar, the image in the book, and the hangar. Now we're going to walk over. Uh, I'm going to uh, disconnect the camera and the tripod uh, and we're going to go uh, freestyle here for a little bit. This time I'm walking a little bit closer to the actual memorial itself. As you can see we have a central spot here. It's a dedication plate. It's dedicated to those people who died on that day. I will zoom in here. I, I should have brought the uh, tripod for this but historical landmark commemorating the 50th anniversary of the airship Hindenburg disaster on this site May 6, 1937, 7.25 p.m. 37, uh, I'm sorry, 36 people perished that day. Now, the site that we have here, I'll look to the north to give you an idea of uh, how this is currently completely embedded in an asphalt-like surface and surrounded by a, uh, a naval anchor chain. Uh, it's quite impressive. It's, uh, it's uh, a little longer than the actual gondola. Uh, if I could get into the hangar today, which I can't, uh, in many circumstances I can, but today is not one of those days, I would uh, definitely show you uh, the gondola that was used in the 1972 film uh, called The Hindenburg. But let's go ahead and zoom in here a little bit there, give you an idea of these massive doors that were used. Now I'll zoom back out a little bit, and those doors, you can't tell, but I'll bring up some, some, uh, some drawings and or photographs that will give you a much better idea of, uh, there we go, of how huge those doors are. But they were hand opened at one time by two large cranks at the very top. It would take uh, 16 to 24 men to uh, push these large uh, wooden uh, uh, spokes on a wheel type of a, of a setup to open the doors and it would take as much as 12 hours to open the, uh, the set of doors on either end of, uh, of the hangar. Right there, the, again that, that is the uh, wind mast or the wind vane that's used now to show us the direction that the wind currently blows. and the site itself. Now the chain here, uh, this chain is sizable stuff. Uh, I kid you not when I say 
I'll put my hand in the picture and let you know that we're talking two and a half to three inch round sections of chain just uh, you know tens and tens of thousands of pounds of chain that's involved uh, around this memorial uh, there's really no great place to get a total view of the memorial nor do I understand the uh, the reasoning for the color or the uh, particular patterns that are used but let's flash back for a second here now we went back over to the hangar if you look at hangar one and and we'll zoom in a little further either you'll notice somewhat similar colors you'll notice uh, red and like a like a, a pink and a white and a gray tone tile now from the ground that doesn't look like much supposedly uh, and this is right from any captain who's ever flown over this base at an altitude of roughly 5,000 feet uh, you cannot see hangar number one as huge as that is and at 804 feet long the Hindenburg had to have its nose uh, cone taken off in order for those doors on that hangar to uh, be able to close to shut in the great vessel. Now mind you, nobody wanted to take and close a giant uh, hydrogen filled balloon uh, into a closed space so most of the time the doors were kept open and the nose cone was left on the, the Hindenburg but the important thing is to realize that as huge as that building is it could uh, house that and still hold two smaller blimps uh, used for surveillance uh, along the eastern seaboard for of all things uh, Nazi subs and of course 1937 uh, the reason that the Hindenburg was using hydrogen gas instead of helium is that the United States was the largest supplier of helium in the world and we did not want to give that to uh, the Germans because we had a pretty good idea what was happening in Germany at the time and we knew eventually we would be somehow involved in a world war and it would be with them. So this is John Clayton, your host from Bmaster.com showing you once again the Hindenburg Memorial in Lakehurst, New Jersey